so I'm a little nervous, but I can imagine you're a little nervous as well, so let me at the outset try to put things to rest and calm you down. Uh, I am an atheist, but uh, don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to steal your soul. Uh, I don't even think you have a soul, so you know, you don't got to worry about that. I want to steal your iPhone, so don't worry. I know there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about atheists out there. So uh, go ahead and advance the slide. I'm, I'm a normal guy. Look, I'm a husband, I'm a father, uh, there's my family. They're actually in attendance today in the back. So, uh, yeah, I think if you take a look at the picture, you, you can see that I lucked out. Um, <laughs> ladies, just so you know, the, the goal for guys is, is to marry up. And so, uh, mission accomplished for me, right? So, uh, can I get an amen, as I say? <laughs> so, yeah, I just put that up there to show you that I'm a I'm, I'm normal I'm just like you guys. We have the same goal. Like I care about truth. And I'm not up here to try to convert you. Okay? That's not my goal here. So if you maintain your faith in God after this, that's fine. I still care about you. No big deal. My goal, rather, is twofold. Number one, to give you a chance to dialogue with an atheist who was once in your shoes. I said exactly where you are, though. Not in dolls. Um, <laughs> but uh, to do that and also to hopefully make you think. So if after this session it pushes you to think about reality and the world a little bit deeper than uh, mission accomplished for me, I have met my goal. So uh, go ahead and advance the slide. I've got a lot to cover, so I'm gonna, this is gonna be quite a drink from a fire hydrant. I'm gonna go really fast, and then we'll have some, some chance of dialogue at the end. But let me tell you a little bit about my story first. Uh, I actually, as I mentioned, I did grow up Christian. Uh, I was very heavily involved in church and in high school. I wasn't involved in dolls, but I was involved in a group called Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And so I was uh, active in youth group. And then when I, uh, when I got to college, things started to change. I met a number of friends and some professors who uh, put some challenges before me and um, some, some questions that I really couldn't answer. And that led me to, to a bit of a search. And as my love for science grew, my faith waned over time, or eventually I, I did end up walking away because the challenges were just uh, just too much. So that's a little bit about me. I, I used to be in your shoes, but I changed my mind after you know a good bit of search. So what were some of the things that were put before me that caused me to question? Um, go ahead and advance the slide. The first thing is, uh, I figured out pretty quickly when I went to college that I was Christian because I was raised that way, and, and reason and evidence really didn't have much to do with it. Um, in fact, faith is essential to Christianity, right? Because the Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please God. And so I can actually remember when this first dawned on me. My roommate, his name was Rocky, he, he was very smart, he was an agnostic, and he would uh, pose challenges to me, and he, would, he said uh, one day, uh, Rich, know that if you grew up in India, you probably wouldn't be a Christian, you'd be a Hindu, right? And I kind of thought for a minute, I was like, yeah, okay, so what? And he's like, well, that shows that uh, religion is, is more about faith than it is um, evidence and reason. It's more about social conformity, you know, I mean, it, it depends on how you're raised, right? And I said, oh, okay, yeah, you got a good point. Uh, and I kind of thought back on what I had gotten so far in youth group and um, yeah, it seems that faith is really essential to Christianity, and go ahead and advance the slide. Faith, by definition, is what you do when you don't have the evidence, right? Um, it's like if you, if you had evidence to warrant your beliefs, well, you, you wouldn't need faith. You wouldn't have room for it. So, um, yeah, it seemed like that really matched up with what I had been taught so far. Go ahead and advance the slide. In fact, um, Peter Bogosian, who is an, he's a philosopher at Portland State University, he really nails it. He says, says the following. If you had sufficient evidence, if you had sufficient evidence to warrant belief in a particular claim, then you wouldn't believe the claim on the basis of faith. Faith is the word you use when you do not have enough evidence to justify holding a belief, but when you just go ahead and believe anyway. And I was, I was yeah, that, that matches up with what the Bible says. So go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, two of many verses in the Bible that show this, this kind of faith. Faith is confidence, Hebrews 11, 1, in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So you see there, faith and evidence are like oil and water, they're really like bedfellows, and, and it's essential to have faith to be a Christian. And 2 Corinthians 5, 7 puts it even more starkly. 
We walk by faith, not by sight. And so that's the kind of belief that is required of a Christian, but over time, that's, that's just, I, I just couldn't do that anymore. I became a, a man of science. So now as an atheist, faith really uh, doesn't factor much into my life at all. I, I follow the evidence. I'm a man of science, and so, um, you know, we, we take different parts of knowledge from different domains of study, and that leads us to things that exist. And so over time, the professors that I had in my, in my classes uh, encouraged me to take that view. So eventually that's kind of uh, where I came to believe. And so now I really, I'll talk about this in a minute. I really wouldn't describe myself as an atheist. I would describe myself as a free thinker. And uh, I'm actually a lot more happy now than I was when I was shackled by, by blind faith. I know that there's a lot of uh, stereotypes of atheists out there as, you know, we go around wearing black turtlenecks and <laughs> black nail polish and talk about the meaninglessness of life. And, uh, but actually, nothing could be further from the truth. I'm, I'm much more happy now than I was as a believer. And I've got plenty of reason to live and plenty of meaning in my life. I just showed you a picture a while ago of uh, one of those sources of meaning, my family, which I love deeply. So, yeah, it's not true that we have no meaning in life and uh, that sort of thing. So, um, there's that. And uh, let, me, let me talk for a little bit about what it actually means to be a free thinker or, you know, if you prefer, an, an atheist. Because I, I think there's some uh, misconceptions about that. Um, let me put it this way, okay? Atheism is not the belief that God doesn't exist. Atheism is not a belief system at all, really. It's not the belief in the non-existence of God. So I really don't have to, you know, I really don't have anything to defend. And you might say, well, um, what's the difference? You know, I don't see the difference between saying that I lack a belief, which is what atheism actually is, and the belief that God doesn't exist. So it sounds like, Rich, that you're splitting hairs. And actually, there's, uh, there's a big difference between the lack of belief in God, which is what atheism really is, and actually the belief in the non-existence of God. And, and it's this. Uh, the burden of proof lies on the person who makes the claim. And so I'm not making a claim that God doesn't exist. And I really, really can't prove the negative. Um, I just lack belief in God, and so the burden of proof would be on you guys, because you guys are the ones that are making the claim. You guys are the ones that are claiming that God does exist, so you need to provide me with warrant if you want to persuade me. I really don't have anything to defend since I'm not really making a claim. That which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So I just, I look out in the world and I, I just don't see evidence of a God. And, and that's why I'm an atheist. Um, if you're not convinced by that, that's fine. But let me, let me put it this way. Go ahead and uh, advance the slide. Uh, actually, I, I, I missed this. Let me miss a really great, uh, great quote. So let, me, let me state this. This is from Christopher Hitchens, who uh, he passed away a few years ago, but he, um, he debated Christians a lot and was a really smart guy. He says this about religion. One must state it plainly. Religion comes from the period of human prehistory where nobody not even the mighty Democritus who concluded that all matter was made from atoms, had the smallest idea of what was going on. It comes from the bawling and fearful infancy of our species and is a babyish attempt to meet our inescapable demand for knowledge, as well as for comfort, reassurance, and other infantile needs. Today, the least educated of my children knows much more about the natural order than any of the founders of religion, and one would like to think, though the connection is not a fully demonstrable one, that this is why they seem so uninterested in sending fellow humans to hell. And so that just contrasts you know, faith with uh, you know, being people of science, all right? But back to atheism, okay? So go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, it turns out when you Google the phrase tooth fairy, you get the rock. So <laughs> that's my top point here. Um, what if, who, who here believes in the tooth fairy? Anybody? Okay, good. Um, so what if I, what if I were to, if, you, if I had a raised hand, we'd have different problems. But what if I were to say, uh, you don't believe in the tooth fairy, prove that he doesn't exist. You have to give me evidence for your non-belief, for your, for your disbelief in the tooth fairy. You'd be like, well, that's, that's unfair. Like, I, no, I don't, I don't need to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not an ah, tooth fairy-ish. I don't need to prove that the tooth fairy doesn't exist. Because we've closed the book on that, right? We've, 
We kind of looked around, we don't find any evidence. And so it's kind of like, like Zeus, you know, we've, we've just moved on from that, okay? Well, that's precisely parallel with, with atheism. I, mean, I just don't see evidence. And so until I get sufficient evidence, I'm, I'm warranted in, in just maintaining a lack of belief in God. Okay? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And so if you want me to join you, you need to give me extraordinary evidence. And you have to admit that you have your work cut out for you. Because, look, a resurrection doesn't happen every day, right? Uh, dead people stay dead. Period. And so you guys believe that 2,000 years ago, a man in uh, Palestine somewhere died on a Roman cross, and then three days later somehow resurrected himself from the dead. Uh, that's pretty big news. And so if you want to persuade me, you have to clear a pretty high bar of proof. It's like, just if I said, hey, Santa Claus is out there in the foyer, you wouldn't be like, oh yeah, let's go. You would, you would demand pretty, uh, pretty extraordinary proof, right? Much more proof that you demand than if I said, you know, a classmate is out there in the foyer. Well, that's pretty ordinary, so ordinary evidence will suffice, okay? So with uh, God and Jesus, you, you have to give me pretty extraordinary evidence, and I just, I just haven't seen that, okay? Um, you, you, what you need to realize is that you guys, we have a lot in common, okay? You guys are atheists with respect to 99.99% of the gods that are out there, okay? The only difference between you and me, go ahead and advance the slide, is that I just go one God further. Okay? So you guys don't, you know, you, you lack belief in Thor and Zeus and Krishna, and uh, you know, when you Google God, you get more than free, not better. Uh, right? That's the, what movie is that? Bruce Almighty? I think that might be a little bit older than you guys, but <laughs> anyway, uh, I just, hey, go ahead and advance the slide. I just, I just add Jesus to the mix. That's it. So I just go one God further. So when you understand why you reject all those other gods, you will understand why I reject the God of the Bible, why I reject Yahweh, and why I lack belief in Jesus. Okay? So, um, that's a little bit about atheism. Atheism is the default position. It is where everybody starts. Everybody starts with a blank slate, a neutral ground. And so, you know, God is, is a bit of an add -on. Okay? So, uh, go ahead and advance the slide. So I can understand that if you look at things like the Northern Lights, that you'd be moved to awe because it's so beautiful. And you're like, uh, this is so awesome that there's no way that that happened through natural means. A God had to have done it. I can understand that if you that you would posit God in reaction to things like the Grand Canyon, the Northern Lights, and such, but recognize that as a leap of faith. Okay, as I'll explain in a minute, uh, that is that is a, a reaction of awe to beauty. And that is not sufficient evidence to posit a God. Okay. So let's let's actually get to some of the arguments for God's existence because sometimes Christians do provide what they think is evidence. So I'm going to go through and explain some of these, and I'll tell you why I don't think they pass the test. Okay. Uh, go ahead and advance the slide. Now the first is what is called the design argument, and this is put forth by a guy named William Paley in the 1600s. He was a pastor, and uh, it's kind of like what I just said with the Northern Lights. I mean, you look at the universe, and it's so awesomely made that you kind of like, hey, there's no way this happened by evolution. It had to be in God. Okay. Uh, Bailey likened the universe to a, a wristwatch. So if you're walking in the woods and you trip, you fall and pick up the object you tripped on, and it's, and it's a, a wristwatch, and you look at it, and it's intricately made and um, very complex. You conclude that, well, a person must have put that there and made that. It couldn't have just happen. Right? And so the universe is like that for his watch. And uh, this is a, a, a bad argument for several reasons. Number one, it doesn't get you where you need to go, not even close. It doesn't get you to, to your God. Okay, it could have been Krishna, it could have been Allah, it could have been the God of Joseph Smith. It could have been several gods rather than one. It could have been an inferior celestial being. No reason to think that it was a morally perfect, all-knowing, yada, 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 God of, of the Bible. No reason to think that it was Jesus. Okay, so it doesn't, it doesn't get you where you need to go. So that's the first reason. Um, second reason, go ahead and finish the slide. This is what is called the God of the Gaps methodology. Okay, this is a really bad way of arguing. It's when, when we encounter a mystery, we don't know how it could have happened 
naturally. We just kind of plug God into that gap of our ignorance. And advance the slide. This is uh, not good because as physicist Lawrence Krauss states, the lack of understanding of something is not evidence for God. It's evidence of a lack of understanding. One more time in advance. Um, and Neil deGrasse Tyson puts it even better. He says, God is an ever-receiving pocket of scientific ignorance that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as time moves on. And so, you know, these gaps don't tend to last, right? So ages ago, we thought that lightning and thunder was due to Zeus and Thor, or maybe Thor and Zeus, I don't know, flip it. But uh, now we know how the natural world works because our scientific knowledge has progressed. And so we've plugged knowledge into that gap where Zeus and Thor used to exist. And so that's, that's the pattern. As our scientific knowledge has progressed, those gaps get ever smaller and smaller. So um, that is another reason why the design argument just doesn't pass muster for it. Now the next reason is even, is even better. Go ahead and advance the slide. Uh, we do not see perfect design in the universe. We see evidence of bad design. Right, so I mean, yeah, I should have thought that through a little deeper. Um, maybe that bathroom was made by village idiots rather than <laughs> smart guys. But we see the same thing in the, in the universe. We don't see the kind of perfect design that a good, uh, highly intelligent God would, would create, would design, right? So uh, go ahead and advance. Christopher Hitchens, again, he puts it really well. He says, faith of the sort that can stand up to, at least for a while, and confrontation with reason is now plainly impossible. The design argument overlooks the implicable fact that of the other bodies in our own solar system alone, the rest are all either far too cold to support anything recognizable as life or far too hot. The same as it happens is true of our own blue and rounded planetary home, where heat contends with cold to make large tracks of it into useless wasteland, and where we have come to learn that we live and have always lived on a climactic knife edge. Meanwhile, the sun is getting ready to explode and devour its dependent planets like some jealous chief or tribal deity, some design. So it, does, it just doesn't look like this would come from the sort of God that you guys believe in. Okay. And then lastly, um, if the universe cries out for a designer because it is, it is beautiful and intricately made and it's complex, well then who designed God? Okay, because God is supposed to be even more beautiful than the universe. God is supposed to be even more complex because he's got a, a, an intelligent mind, right? So if the universe was designed, then who designed God? So it doesn't really get you, it doesn't really explain anything. It just kind of kicks the explanatory can down the road. All right, so I think the design argument is not really a good one. Uh, go ahead and advance the slide to the next argument. The next argument is what is called the anthropic principle. And the anthropic principle is this. It looks like the universe was made for us. Uh, if you take a look at the variables required for life to even exist at all, they are really, really, really fine-tuned. They've got to relate to each other in the exact, to the exact degree. And it looks like you know, somebody has kind of monkeyed with the dials, right? It, it, if you have a 100-number sequence that you need to you know, roll some dice or pull some lever, and uh, you, you need to get that sequence, if you get that sequence 10, 15, 20 times in a row, well, it looks like somebody's cheating, right? And the anthropic principle says the universe is kind of the same thing, but the probability for life to exist is so small, it's so close to zero, that it, it couldn't have happened by chance, okay? Now, I, I think this argument, like the design argument, is a bad one. It's not really good evidence um, because of all the critiques that I said of the design argument. Plus, I think this one um, is, is borderline arrogant, and I I don't mean this to sound harsh, okay, just, just, just hear me out, all right? Um, are we supposed to exist, uh, to, to believe that all of this hugeness in the universe, you know, if you study the universe, it will, it will blow your mind how, how big space is. And it will likewise, just like Hitchens alluded to, it will blow your mind at how much of it is just an utter waste, utter meaningless waste of space. And so all of this is supposed to exist for us, uh, we are tiny, 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 tiny specks on a tiny, 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 tiny blue speck. I mean, cosmically speaking, we are smaller than ants. And so this was supposed to just exist just so we could kind of enjoy life. I, uh, I don't buy it. And what's more, uh, scientists have recently been uh, toying with and doing a deep dive into a, an explanation that is much more scientific and simpler in, in my mind. Uh, guys like Lawrence Krauss and Stephen Hawking, when he was alive, are doing a deep dive into what is called the multiverse theory, the multiverse view. 
And the multiverse view says that, well, the, the life remaining universe is not the result of some intelligent god. Uh, rather, this is not the only universe that is, that is possible. Um, this universe that is life remaining is part of an infinitely large ensemble of other possible worlds. And such, you know, when, when you have 100 tries and you're trying to get the sequence, well, uh, your odds are really low. But if you have an infinite number of tries to pull that lever, then eventually you're going to get the sequence that you need, no matter how improbable it is. The probability isn't zero, the probability is one, because you have an infinite number of tries. And so since uh, our universe is one part of an infinitely large ensemble of other possible worlds, then, you know, it's, it's nothing extraordinary to think that this life in the universe exists. So I find that to be uh, much more simple and much more scientific than, than the supposition that an invisible deity, you know, kind of vanished with this into existence. Okay, so that's the anthropic principle. Uh, the next is the moral argument. So go ahead and advance the slide, please. Uh, this is the notion that God has to exist to explain morality. Uh, God has to exist for be right and wrong. If God doesn't exist, then everything's permitted. And uh, look, I'm going to level with you. I think this is probably the worst one to watch. Okay? Um, I don't need to believe in God to know that what ISIS does is wicked and evil. Okay, I, don't, I don't need to be a Christian. I don't need to have the Bible or to read the Bible to know that. All you need is a conscience. All you need is empathy and to have some decency for your fellow human being. And Christians and atheists alike can do that. And so I find this kind of insult to, to suppose that you know, atheists can't know right and wrong. Um, in fact, a lot of atheists, you guys are probably like this, a lot of atheists beat the pants off a lot of Christians when it comes to the empathy department. You know, so I just don't find this to be a very convincing argument like the rest of them. And the next would be the cosmological argument. Okay, the cosmological argument is the supposition that out of nothing, nothing comes. So uh, God exists as some like a first mover to kind of flip the dominoes into uh, in, into falling to start everything off, kind of a first cause that brought the world into existence. Uh, I don't think this is a good argument or good uh, sufficient evidence because like the design argument, it doesn't get you to where you need to go. At most, it just gets you some general philosophical principle, some um, you know, first mover of the cosmos, but it doesn't get you an all-knowing, all-powerful dot, 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 God, right? And uh, to go back to Hawking and Krauss, uh, what they have shown, what we now know is at the quantum level, things happen uncaused and pop into existence out of nothing all the time. Okay, so at the quantum level, if something can come from nothing, then I see no reason to suppose that it can't happen uh, macroly as well with uh, the Big Bang. Okay, so scientists have a better explanation; they have knowledge to plug into that gap of our ignorance, like all, all the rest. And then we have sometimes uh, Christians argue for God's existence based on the uh, resurrection. They say that the resurrection of Jesus provides good evidence for God's existence. And um, like the others, I reject this. This is not very good evidence, simply because it all comes from the Bible. And the Bible is a very suspect source when it comes to, um, you know, being trustworthy. So I don't think we can have any confidence that the Bible that we have today is the message that was originally given. Okay? It's like that game of telephone. You start with the Benedict Cumberbatch and then four or five iterations down the road, you end with the Peppermint Scooby Snack or Poopy, Poopy Scooby Doo or something. You know? And uh, I can't go into depth in this, I wish I could, but let me just give you a little bit. Uh, what we know now from the work of scholars like Bart Ehrman and such is that the, the manuscripts of the Bible, there are over 300,000 variants. Let that number sink in. Okay, you know what a variant is, right? So when you got two manuscripts and you're comparing them side by side and you see differences, that those are variants. Okay? So there's over 300,000 of those. There's actually more variants than there are words in the New Testament. And so if that's the, the kind of record that we have, how can we have any confidence at all that the message that we have today, and the Bible that you guys have in your pockets or whatever, is the one that was originally written? I think that obliterates all the confidence we have. Okay? And what's more, the process of putting together the Bible was a, a political process fraught with corruption. It happened hundreds of years after the events themselves. It was uh, done by popes and conferences that they had a narrative that they wanted to that they wanted to center, and so they suppressed the minority voices. There are over a hundred other gospels. And we can read them. 
All right, you can uh, go ahead and advance the slide. This is actually a copy of a fragment of the Gospel of Philip. Uh, so you can have access to it, but why aren't they in the Bible? Why didn't they get the official stamp of the church? Well, it's, it's very simple. They had narrative. Okay, it's like you guys, I hear Christians complain about uh, media bias all the time. Say, hey, why didn't CNN report on this? Well, it's because they, they have a narrative, and this goes against their narrative, so they're going to they're memory hold And uh, the popes, and even Constantine, you know, got his little grubby hands in the process. Uh, they, they memory hold the other Gospels. Okay, so let me just read some of the other Gospels. This, this is not all of them, this is just some of them. Uh, but this just kind of drives home the point, right? So, uh, Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Basilides, Gospel of Peter, I mentioned the Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Perfection, History of Joseph the Carpenter, Proto-Evangelium of James, Gospel of the Savior. These are all other alternative Gospels, and um, why aren't they in the Bible beside Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? So that even obliterates the confidence that I have in the Bible even more. The process was just... Uh, kind of messy. Okay. Now, so those are the most common arguments for God's existence and why I reject them. But let me give an actual direct argument for God's non existence. I don't need to do that because of what I said earlier, but I can. So go ahead and advance the slide. Um, this is the problem of evil. Now, if you want how the philosophers put it, if you want it in syllogism form, um, in its technical variation, that's, it's, that's it up there on the board. But you don't need that to uh, feel the weight of the problem of evil. All you need is just reflect on your experience and reflect on the experience of your fellow human beings. Uh, for every, you know, you, you might be able to say, hey, you know, my, God healed my uncle of, of his back injury. It's like, well, okay, well, he was probably being treated by a doctor. Never mind that, none of my business. Uh, but for every supposed miracle you can present to me, I can show you, a, a, you know, thousands of evidence, thousands of examples of gratuitous, utterly meaningless evil. Why didn't God intervene there? Uh, why doesn't God intervene to cure children of leukemia? Yeah, sure enough, maybe you've heard of a testimony or two of that happening, but there's, there's plenty of times that doesn't happen. Um, God is supposed to be a God of love, but he just kind of sits by coldly and watches that happen. I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to be the cold-hearted atheist, and I, I would stop it if I could. So I, it's, just, it's just a bridge too far for me. You know, put it a little bit differently, um, why, if, if people were born gay, why would they immediately be condemned to a life of never experiencing love? Or even worse, killed for trying to seek that love? Uh, I, I just, I don't get that. Why would a God of love condemn somebody for feeling love when he's making that way? You know, it's, it's just, like I guess that bridge too far for me. And the last thing I'm going to say before I get to uh, questions, uh, go ahead and advance the slide. I, I'm, I'm going to say this at the risk of sounding uh, offensive and harsh, but... Guys, I just want you to think about this. Um, I don't think the God that is presented in the Bible is a God that is, that is worthy of worship. Uh, specifically, the God of the Old Testament. You know, this is, a, this is an all-girls group. So, um, you know, in the Old Testament, rape is definitely believed at. And it's encouraged. And in places, like in Leviticus, it is, um, it is actually commanded. I, I can't do that. Okay. I can't worship a God that... Uh, co commanded his army to commit genocide. He commanded his army to wipe out a whole people group, men, women, and children, everybody, just because he wanted his preferred group to take over the land. That's, that's not a, a God worthy of worship. So these were the challenges that were brought before me when I went to college and the challenges that eventually led me to come with the and to change my mind. So I know this might be a lot, but what I actually want to do right now is uh, keep, keep the slide there, don't advance it. What I want to do right now is I want to take a few moments to get some feedback from you guys. I assume that you are going to disagree with what I said, otherwise you wouldn't be indulged. So that is fine. That is fine. If you maintain faith in God after this, I'm okay with that. But let's, uh, let's do a little dialogue here. Okay? What do you guys think?
Yeah, yeah. Well, I, uh, there there was no like official record from the Roman government about the right to Jews. The, the gospels that were written. Uh, I mean, if I'm to take your point of view for a moment, they were written by the followers of Jesus. Now, I, I don't think they were actually written by the followers of Jesus. I think they were written far after the death of those who uh, followed Jesus. And so, you know, Matthew, it's not that Matthew wrote it, says names of names of those who were written some of the right? So, yeah, there was no official record. And, and there were there were messiahs who popped up like this all the time. There, in fact, the, the notion of a dying and rising God was not unique to Jesus. You know, there were there were uh, Greek cults all the time that had dying and rising gods. So one of them was the cult of Mithras. Mithras has uh, similarly a dying and rising uh, messiah that they worship. And so this was something that was common. And uh, I don't think Pilate really wanted to uh, suppress all that even if he could. Because it's just, you know, it's like kind of back Let's go over here and we'll go over here. So I see the names like we constantly put stuff in the forefront of our life. So we say that our God is Yahweh, and we put that as what we're chasing towards in our life. And no matter like what, because we are human, we're going to have something that we worship or something that we strive for, no matter what we say we believe. But we say we believe a God that forgives, that allows us to repent, allows us to follow Him. We say we serve a God who's gracious. But then you. Yeah, well, I, I do hear this from Christians from time to time. They, they try to give some sort of psychological explanation for why I don't believe. I would discourage you against that. I think that's kind of unfair. Um, I would focus, if I were you, on the case and on the evidence and, and weigh the evidence rather than uh, talking about my motives and whatnot. Um, it might be true that I have some nefarious motive, but that doesn't make what I presented false or, or a bad argument. You have to assess the arguments on their own merits. Um, yeah, it's, it's true, let me kind of, uh, you didn't really ask this question, but you remind me of something that I wanted to say. It is true that I, I don't worship a higher power, um, but I still have meaning in my life. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm a humanist, and so I believe in my fellow man, I believe in that when I leave this world, I want to leave it better than when I came into it. And so I, I try to love my family as best I can, I try to do the best job as a teacher that I can. I still have uh, a lot of meaning in my life, and I still think that I'm doing good. And I pursue, I pursue knowledge, because I think knowledge is worthy uh, in and of itself, regardless of whether I worship a God or not. So let's let's go here, and then we'll go we'll go this way. Okay, go ahead. Fair, fair question. That quote comes from Richard Dawkins. I, I didn't read it, but Richard Dawkins is a biologist from Oxford, by the way. Um, uh, he calls God unforgiving, specifically the Old Testament God. And yet, the, true to the story, the Israelites did rebel um, from time to time. But um, God is, is really, man, he's, he's, got, he's got a, he makes Stalin look like a, a Boy Scout. Uh, let me give you an example. Okay, there's a, there's a story in the Bible. I forget the, the names of the two guys. Um, they really have uh, Israelite names because they were the tribe of Israel. But they were, they were part of the, the team that was carrying the Ark of the Covenant to a certain location. And the Ark of the Covenant, um, somebody trips and, and, and the Ark of the Covenant it, it about falls to the ground. And so one of these men, or both of them, reach out to study the Ark of the Covenant because if it falls to the ground, that would be a big deal. You, know, you, don't, you don't do that to the like the house of God. And so they, they reach out and they study the Ark of the Covenant and God immediately ends their life just like that because they want to protect the Ark of the Covenant because that was against the rules. And that, that strikes me like if I if I rank my class like that, you know, if, if somebody sneezes 
because they couldn't help dealing with me. And I, um, you know, send them to the principal's office. I'd, I'd be fired pretty quickly. And there's other things too. You know, I talked about um, God's rules against uh, being gay and, and how that was treated in, in, the, in the Old Testament. That just seems to me pretty, um, you know, just like that. Right? Do you have a follow up real quick before I go over here? Do you have a follow up? Okay. Um, no. All right. Let's go over here, and then we'll come back this way. Go ahead. Right, so um, I, I am pro-choice. It's not, it's not my business to tell a, a woman what to do with her body, you know. So I'm addressing you guys. I, I really can't tell you uh, how to behave. I'm, I'm all for women's rights. But I think what you've done is actually you've committed a logical fallacy called the two cocaine fallacy, or the two wrongs fallacy. And it's this. Uh, when I'm talking about the character of God in the Old Testament, you turn it back on me and distract. It's like, what about abortion? So another way this is put is called what aboutism. And so well, you can you can what about me to death? You can what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? But what matters and what we're talking about is what kind of God is presented in the Old Testament and, and is that God worthy of worship? That's the real subject. So I think all due respect, your question is a bit of a distraction. So go ahead. I don't think that's inevitable, but I think that is happening. I think the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, and that's kind of what it means to evolve, right? Evolve, you know, if you look at it at the biological level, um, things improve over time. You guys and me, human beings, we are an improvement from uh, one cell organisms, right? So morally speaking, it's the same thing. That, that, that does happen. I think it's happening right now. Go ahead. What about it? Well, 
Well, okay. Um, I, I think you're you're confusing categories here. So, uh, evolution. If you take a look at evolution, if you read Darwin's Origin of the Species, what you see in the fossil record is definitely a march from simple to more complex organisms. That is undoubtedly in the record. I don't think anybody's going to argue that um, we have devolved from one cell organisms. Right? The tree of life has gotten more complex. Now, you talk about the second law of thermodynamics. I do think that that is a thing, right? I, I'm a man of science. I, I happen to think that that is real. That is evidence for what's called the Big Bang. The uh, Big Bang, I, I, there's a lot of different models of how the universe began or, or why it's here rather than nothing. Um, but one of the best is, is what's called Big Bang cosmology. And that is the notion that the universe, sometime in the, in the finite past, was it, it started by a, a giant explosion, a big bang. And one of the reasons why we think that, and I kind of get to my point here, is that it's because of the second law of thermodynamics. We see uh, space expanding and things kind of slowing down, and that sort of thing. So that gives us evidence for the big bang. But I don't think that is evidence of a lack of moral progress, nor is it evidence for the, the like uh, lack of evolution at the biological level. I think those are two different things. Okay. Uh, go over here, and then we'll come here real quick. Okay, oh, before I ask a question, am I, a, am I correct in assuming that you believe in evolution and not selection? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I believe what's called the neo Darwinian synthesis. Yeah. Okay. So, given that, with COVID happening right now, why should we shut down? Wouldn't that just be an opportunity for not selection that the strongest would survive COVID and then the weakest would die off? So are you saying that us shutting down uh, paradoxically makes our immune systems weaker and more susceptible to viruses like that? Is that kind of what you're saying? Just why would we shut down in the first place if, you know, say this disease, like if you get it, the weaker one would die off, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. given that you believe in that, Okay, right. So I don't, I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a, what's called a social Darwinist. That would be kind of like where the Nazis took it. I'm, I'm not a Nazi, thank God. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we have to obey everything that evolution has given us. So we don't have to obey every single instinct. So we obey. Uh, we go with that which has that which has helped us progress and helped us survive. And so love would be one of those things, and killing off the weak would not. Um, because, you know, I know this might sound a little paradoxical, but societies that help the weak, somewhat ironically, tend to survive better because of the overall general ethic that, that love and looking out for your fellow human being in the long run. Even though, yes, the the weak might you know kind of be carried along, uh, the the ethic overall in the long run does help the species. Because like, you know, remember I said a while ago about bottom monkeys who, who exhibit altruistic behavior and elephants that uh, mourn for the young and things like that. that. That helps them be a more cohesive group overall. And so that's, that's what I think about that. All right, we got, we got time for about one more question. Let me go in the middle there. Go ahead. I think that uh, when you die, so I don't believe in any sort of soul or non-physical part of you. I think that you are your body. So when you die, your body is, is in the grave and your body starts decaying. And, and that is it. So you, you cease to exist after you die. You got a you follow-up real quick? Okay. Uh, one more. Go ahead. I, did I say that when you die, you go to a better place? My grandma? Okay, yeah, I don't think you go to a better place because I don't think there's a better place. All right, I lied. Uh, we got time for one more. Go ahead. <laughs>
Um, this is what is called the free will defense, which is one, uh, one answer that Christians put forth in the argument for evil. Um, look, I don't, I don't see, I guess what I would ask you is, is how is it contradictory to suggest that God could have uh, prevented Adam from eating the apple, the apple of the apple? I mean, is that logically possible? I see where you're going. I, you know, I don't think there's any contradiction in saying that God could bestow free will upon us, but at the same time create a world where he doesn't exist. That doesn't seem to me to be, um, if God is all-powerful, outside his scope. Okay, look, I know we've got a lot of questions, but we got to move on here. Um, maybe you guys want shit, granted, but were you, were you challenged at least? Well, I hear some comments. All right, well, uh, the good news is, go ahead and advance the slide. The good news is, oh, um, I actually don't wear glasses. Uh, these are props. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the uh, good news is that you were challenged and you had a discussion, but uh, it wasn't with an atheist. <laughs> 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 Are your parents going to be satisfied? No. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think your parents are going to say, hey, you, you need to study. You need to, you need to get motivated. You, need, you have some work to do. Right? So that's why we did this. Go ahead and advance the slide. Um, this was hopefully a bit of a wake up call. Uh, because the only arguments that I presented today, I would, I would put them out the middle of the road. Well, it would have been the most rigorous. You know, if we had time to talk through the case of the Bible and I could like, really uh, suss out that role play, we'd get really deep there. But um, I hope you guys saw that you, you need some additional training. Okay, because the stakes are low, right? The pressure's off. That's the good news. I'm on your team. All right, you're in a safe place. But eventually you're going to get out on your own. And the stakes are going to be higher there. And you're going to be in your dorm. You're going to be with a rock. The rock is a real story, by the way. I really did have a roommate my freshman year named Rocky. The only thing I left out is he was gay. And so we were talking a lot about these things. And eventually it got to the point where I was like, dude, I, I got to answer this guy. Or I gotta, I'm out. Because I don't want my faith to be a placebo. And I was pretty inarticulate when I got to college. And um, I really didn't know what I didn't know. And that's a common experience. Okay, and fortunately, I had a number of, of uh, older Christians that could point, that took the life of mine seriously, that could point me in the right direction. Uh, Ryan, the one of them is named Darwin. So I you know, <laughs> so say that with a little bit of humor. Um, but yeah, after that, when I, when I started seeking, when I started studying, that's when my walk with Christ took off. Um, but I didn't get to that point until I was motivated. And I wasn't motivated until I figured out that uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what I was talking about. I, I couldn't really adequately defend because uh, things came in pretty fast. Right? And, and you guys are in the place right now where you don't even need to wait for college to get that stuff. Uh, thanks to the explosion of social media and the internet, you're getting bombarded with daily you know, memes and stuff like that. Like it's, it's coming at your head. So actually, um, there's been a lot of studies done in the last 10 or 15 years that show that uh, about 60 to 80 percent of youth who are raised in religious homes walk away within a year or two after college. And that's not nominal believers. That's, that's you know, a lot, a lot of students like you, very devout, go to youth group, or leaders in youth group, or maybe even go to a Christian high school. So it didn't exempt them. So don't think that you're exempt either. Um, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty hot and heavy battle out there. And, uh, you know, think about, what, what's 60% of this money? So if I just snap my fingers and did the Thanos thing, and 60% of it poof, just disappeared, uh, how many would be left? Well, the, the numbers show that's, that's kind of what's happening. All right, so why is that? Why is that happening, and, and how can it be prevented? Well, um, the good news is it's not because of Christianity itself. So I just role play as an atheist. I think those arguments have good answers. Uh, I've I've stood in the pocket for a long time now, so you can take take that and you know hopefully that'll give you a little bit more confidence. But we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Uh, every age of church history has featured many sharp minds who have stood in the gap and advanced the challenges and objections of the day, convinced of them, rid of and that's still true today. We have a very, very deep bench of people who are doing the same thing. So we kind of have an almost embarrassing purchase if you can get an analogy. Um, but the reason why that so many students walk away is not because the Christianity itself is intellectually weak. It's uh, going to advance its line. It's because of lack of preparation. You know, so you get out in the real world and you're not going to get out of So students are kind of falling on their face. Right? And part of the solution is, is being prepared. And that's what we have to do each other. But it's in your hands, right? This conference this weekend, don't let this be the end. Don't pretend like your job's done. It's not. Being a student of Jesus is a lifetime pursuit. And developing a rigorous, deep Christian mind is a necessary part of what it means to be a disciple. It's something that you can't take care of in your So start now. Right? I see a lot of you taking notes. That's good. Um, put yourself on the way. Pay attention. That sort of thing. Talk about the stuff when you leave. And then when you get home, talk about this stuff further. Do a little study. Uh, that's what you need to do. Be a student. Because if you don't, you're going you're to get to the real world. And eventually, you're going to be presented with several challenges that you can answer. But thanks. So, as I said earlier, I'm going to do more time. Okay.
He goes by and invents the story for the next slide. I was kind of playing a game for him. And I want you to recognize the game that I was playing because I was stacking the deck with a little bit of rhetorical tricks. And maybe some of the hands that I didn't get to were going to call me out on it. But by and large, you guys, you guys let me do that. You kind of let me back the game with games before. And so I just want to uh, help you recognize uh, the, the, the game that was afoot, right? So there was a lot of things that I did with my words to put the thumb in the scale. Uh, one of the things is I use weasel words. Um, now I'm sure you guys have had this experience where you walk into the woods and you encounter a mountain, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so when you encounter a mountain lion, if you read the worst case scenario handbook, you're supposed to like wear your sleeve your jacket out and give yourself a little bigger than you are. So the mountain lion thinks, oh my gosh, that, that's, that guy's huge, and it runs away. So I was doing the same thing in my record. I was saying things like, we now know, or studies show, or this is actually pretty simple. Right? That's a little thing like that. And when you encounter somebody that says that, a lot of people recognize that you're being had, and don't let them get away from it. So like, ask the probing question, which you guys did something, I guess, but like, who's we? What do you mean, we now know? Let's spell it out, be more specific, don't just say we know, maybe we don't. Um, what studies, be more specific with the studies. Who convened them? Was it a random or convenience sample? How many were studied? What was the methodology? You know, ask those penetrating questions, don't let people get away with the reason for it, okay? Secondly, uh, every single argument of, of, of poor guy's existence was what's called a straw man. I attacked all the straw men out there. Uh, I didn't really get a single one right. And I had a lot of atheists that do this. Okay, the straw man fallacy is a bad way of arguing. It's when you uh, set up a weaker version of your opponent's argument and you attack that, and then you pretend like you defeated the real McCoy. It's like, well, if I, I don't know if this analogy is going to Maybe we'll learn. But if I if I knock out a cardboard cutout of Conor McGregor, and then I you know pretend like I defeated the real guy in the UFC, then I can't really lay claim to beating up on Conor McGregor. I just like kick, kick the cardboard cutout in the shins a couple times. You know? So that's what the strongman fallacy does in arguing. So I do that with every single argument. I really butchered the moral argument. I don't know if you really that. Um, the design argument, you know, it's not the guy with gaps. Um, Intelligent design folks give plenty of scientific evidence if they're allowed to. And uh, the design inference is just that. It is, an, it is an inference based on what we do know. It's not just plugging God into that. It's not saying, well, we don't know how this could happen, so therefore God. Um, if you watch the videos and read the articles on the design argument in that, uh, in that first research, you'll see that. Right? If you read some of the books, you'll, you'll see how specific the case is. So I attacked a lot of strong men. I mean, I'm surprised nobody really called me out on this. You guys let me define faith for you. Yeah. Catch that? I, I define faith for you, so I kind of set up the game in my favor. And that's not the biblical definition of faith. That's not the faith of Jesus. Not, not, that's not the faith of Paul. That faith is not, not part of the Bible. And so recognize when those sorts of tricks are afoot. And, you know, at least in the minds, so you're not intimidated. Because I think those things uh, for the uninitiated really intimidated. There's no response. So you guys did a great job. Uh, thank you. I hope